But thank you for the welcome nonetheless. Can, am I? Oh, there it is. There it is. Um, good morning. My wife instructed me when I talked to her this morning, as always, to say hello to you. So if you've uh, ever been inclined to say hello to my wife, then consider yourself said hello to. Uh, also, I saw Joseph and Lorraine uh, be right before I left Manila. I was in Friday night, through, passed through Manila, and, and uh, we got together. And they said to say hello as well. And I told them it would take too long because they said say hello to everybody. And they said I could do it all at once. And so I'm, I'm taking advantage of that opportunity. Also, I should say, if you ordered coffee, um, please see me over there, the, that front, that corner over there uh, after the service because uh, I'm always too busy to go looking for people. So I don't want to take your coffee home that you, that you or, and drink it myself. Well, I do, but I, I won't. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, the title of the message this morning is The Tapestry and the Song. And the reason that I called it that is because I'm going to talk to you about, well, a, a tapestry and a song. But we're starting into Colossians this week. This is our first week in the book of Colossians. And I, I want to start our time together th this morning by reading the passage that we'll be unpacking uh, during our time together this morning. And I know that we have an issue here uh, reading aloud together while standing uh, because of the, just the nature of the screens, when people stand up, then you can't see past them to actually read from the screen. Um, I, you know, I think, parang basketball players tang lahat. I think that's probably the issue, but uh, we, you know, we don't need to go into that. And, and so I, I wondered whether I should, uh, I should have you all just sit and read, but I'm not terribly comfortable. Uh, reading the Word of God aloud while we're seated. And so if you don't mind, I'll read the passage to you and, uh, and, and, and ask you to listen very carefully. It will also be up on the screen so you can follow along. Uh, Colossians, uh, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 12 of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Powerful, powerful verses, full of many, many ideas. We're embarking this morning on a series of messages that will carry us all the way through the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians between now and Resurrection Sunday. This isn't going to be a year's event, it's just going to be a few months. And most likely you already know, just based on what we read there, that Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. But you may or may not know why he wrote his letter to the Colossians. The city of Colossae was located in the Lycus Valley near Hierapolis. You can see it there on the map, near Hierapolis and Laodicea. And if you know where those two places are, well, then you know where Colossae was. Or, well, we don't really know where Colossae was because the ruins of Colossae have never been found. It's quite remarkable with all the... Uh, 
all of the anthropological work that goes on with all of the digging up and, and discovering that we've never actually found the ruins of Colossae. But we, so we don't know exactly where it was, but we do know what it was near. It was in Lycia, in the Lycus Valley, near Hierapolis and, and uh, Laodicea. The Apostle Paul had never been to the city of Colossae, uh, just like he had never been to Rome before he wrote the letter to them. And so the letter is unique in that regard. Paul usually wrote letters to people with whom he had a relationship already. As he writes to the church at Colossae, he has a reason for writing, but he doesn't know those people there. He had never been there, but he had heard about them from a man named Epaphras. What an interesting name. A man named Epaphras had told Paul uh, about the people at Colossae and what was going on there. Now, Epaphras likely was a man who had heard the gospel from the Apostle Paul himself during the time that Paul was ministering in Ephesus. It's also likely, though not proven, that Epaphras was sent out by the church at Ephesus to establish the church in Colossae, to share the gospel, to make disciples there. Uh, we're not sure of that. It's also likely, though we're not certain, because of the role that Epaphras played, it's also likely that he became an elder there in the church at Colossae. And over time, he thought it, was, it would be wise to get back to the Apostle Paul and talk to him about, about what he had seen there, what he had experienced, what was going on in Colossae. And uh, it's important to note, at least for the sake of the, the book itself as we study it, that Epaphras went to Paul rather than inviting Paul to come to the church at Colossae. It seems like that would have made more sense. You know, just send him a text or something and say, Paul, could you come to Colossae and, you know, maybe speak to the church because there's some things that you could address. Uh, he doesn't do that. Epaphras goes to Paul instead of asking Paul to come to Colossae for one very good reason, and perhaps you can guess it. Paul was in prison, and usually people that are in prison are not allowed to go to other cities and speak in churches there, and so uh, understanding that, Epaphras went to Paul to talk to him about what was happening in Colossae. So it's important to note that everything that you read, everything that Paul will say to the church at Colossae, he is saying from a prison cell, from a prison cell. Epaphras had told Paul all kinds of things. Uh, some, of them were, uh, some of them were good things. Uh, he told them about the faith that the people in Colossae have and how well they loved one another, especially during uh, difficult times, during hard times. But he also uh, had shared some deep concerns that he had for the church at Colossae. This was Epaphras talking to Paul. He shared some deep concerns with Paul because of of, uh, of some of the teaching that the Colossian church was hearing. Perhaps you'll remember from when we studied John, I mean, that was years ago, but when we studied John, uh, we, we discovered as we made our way through that book there that, that, that there were people in the first century, Jews in the first century, in Jerusalem and in Israel, who were inclined to believe Jesus when he said that he was the Messiah. They were prepared to accept him as the Jewish Messiah. But there was one thing that Jesus consistently taught, and John makes this very clear, that became a barrier to the Jews believing in him. Jesus continued to insist that he was the Messiah, but not just the Messiah, he insisted that he was God. And that, that was a, a, a breaking point for some of the Jews of the first century. And so after Jesus was crucified and, and, and came back from the dead and people like the Apostle Paul began traveling everywhere with the good news about Jesus, that he had died for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose again, Paul would go to those places and he would say he is the Messiah of the Jews. He would go to the synagogue and say that he is the Messiah of the Jews. There were so many places where Paul went. But as Paul taught, he also told people that Jesus is God. Not was God in the past tense because he's alive still. Jesus is God. So he is the Jewish Messiah and he is God. And Paul and all of his co-workers, all of his best buds, all of the, the guys that he sent out, all the guys that worked with him, that was two parts of their message. He is the Messiah. He is God. He has died for us. He was buried. He's risen again for us. And that's the good news about Jesus. 
So Paul and his co-workers are going all over the place teaching these two basic truths and the Jews are, are sitting in Jerusalem, the Jewish authorities, and they're not going to put up with it. They're just not going to put up with it. They did everything they could to stop Paul. Paul was in prison as he wrote to the church at Colossae, but, but Paul had, had indoctrinated so many people. They caught the Paul virus, and now they were going everywhere. And the Jewish authorities knew they couldn't stop everybody, so they tried to stop Paul, and, well, they succeeded in some respects, except he's even writing letters now that he's in prison. But the people that were traveling in Paul's stead, the people who were taking the gospel to places like Colossae, were talking about Jesus being the Messiah and, and God. And so the Jewish authorities, rather than sit back and just, like, and just let that happen, they sent out some representatives of their own. They sent out teachers called Judaizers. And the Judaizers would work against Paul and the people who were teaching what Paul was teaching. And they might have been willing to say, oh, if you want to believe he was the Messiah, that's okay. But no, he can't be the Messiah because he claimed to be God. That was what they came out and said. They would teach against. It would be not, not a dance off, but a teach off right there in the synagogue. As Paul would teach, or, or one of Paul's disciples would teach that Jesus is God, the, the Judaizers would get up and do their little dance and, and prove that he absolutely was not. That's what was going on during those days. And so Paul wrote this letter. Uh, Epaphras went to Paul to say, so the, the new believers there in, 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 in Colossae are hearing two different things. They're hearing some people say that Jesus is God. They're hearing other people say that Jesus absolutely is not God. And of course, Paul was concerned about that. And so he wrote this letter to the Colossian church to correct the wrong teaching that they were hearing from the Judaizers. And to help them to understand that not only, listen to me, uh, Colossians is going to be a wonderful ride if you, if you buckle your seatbelt and just stay with it. He wrote that letter to tell them that Jesus is not only God, he is supreme. He is the supreme and central figure, not only in our lives, but in all of the universe. All of the universe finds its pivot in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what Paul is going to tell us in the book of Colossians. Now that's kind of the introduction. Now that we know the players that are involved, it's probably important that we read Paul's introduction to the letter at, to the church at Colossae. Colossians 1, 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, a, one that was sent, a man that was sent by Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. What a beautiful way to start a letter. I don't know how many of you, uh, you know, start your texts. Do you do, how many would do that? During, you just kind of grace and peace. Yeah, see, we don't do that anymore. We don't talk like that. But what a great way to start this letter. There's a lot of information in these first 12 verses. When I, when I first uh, started into it, I was, I was, I don't know if miffed is the right word, if you know what miffed means. I'm not sure that I do, but it's, I like saying it, miffed. Um, I, I wouldn't, because there's just so much, how on earth am I gonna, in 45 minutes going to get across to you everything that's in the first 12 verses of class? And so I, you know, I had my little hissy fit, and then I sat back and took a deep breath, three deep breaths actually, and thought, well, I, there's got to be a way to condense this information and, and make it practical. But, but having said that, you're still going to have to go back home, and uh, I would suggest that you read these, these 12 verses prayerfully meditatively, carefully. But um, Paul is going to be talking about the supremacy of Christ, as I mentioned, but in these first 12 verses, he really doesn't say anything about the supremacy of Christ, for the most part. He does lay a foundation. That's what he's going to do. He's going to lay a foundation on these first 12 verses upon which he can build the rest of the truth of what he will say in this letter. So I want to share with you two illustrations this morning 
uh, than I I thought might help you to understand where Paul is going in these first 12 verses, though we won't have time or opportunity to speak to to every one of the thoughts or ideas that Paul brings up, primarily because I have to fly back to Manila uh, uh, today, and that means I have to be at the airport by five, and so I'd have to stop by four, and I know that's not going to be enough time, and so, uh, you know, and I, uh, how many, did anybody bring their lunch with them? Uh, maybe like five loaves and two fishes, and you can help serve every, well, anyway, we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead with this. I, I wanted to condense it to two illustrations that I hope are going to be helpful for you uh, as we look at these 12 verses, but before I do that, I, I want to tell you a story from God's word. Surprise surprise. I want to tell you a story from God's word that I believe illustrates what Paul is going to be talking to us about uh, in in the book of Colossians, but primarily in these first 12 verses. In this story, I want to turn the clock back, uh, back to the time of creation itself, back to the time when there was an empty void and, and the planet was in chaos. But I'm not going to go through the entire litany, uh, the entire story of creation, I want to start with the sixth day of creation. And so just to kind of get you up to speed, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The the first day, the the earth is there. On the first day he created light. On the second day he created the sky. On the third day he created the dry land and all the plants that grew from it. On the fourth day, he created the sun, the moon, and all of the stars. On the fifth day, he created all of the birds that fly in the air and all the fish that swim in the sea. And having that background there in front of you and understanding what's already happened as the story begins with that background, this is the story from God's word from Genesis chapters one and two. On the morning of the sixth day, God said, let the earth, the dry land, bring forth animals that run and walk and climb and, 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 and slither. Let them, let, them, let them fill the planet. Let them fill everywhere, every corner. And as soon as God had said it, it was so. All of the animals appeared. And uh, God looked at those animals that he had created and, and he looked at everything that he had made up to that point and said, ah, oh, that's so good. That's just, that's good. And then God said, in counsel with the Trinity, let's make one that will bear our image. Let's make one that will carry our likeness. Let's make something that will represent us to all of the rest of creation. And having said that, God took some of the dust of the ground and shaped it into a body and breathed his own breath into the nostrils of that lifeless form that that lay there. And at that instant, man became a living soul. God named the man Adam, and he's the first. He's all grown up. He's able to speak. He's able to think. He wasn't born as a, he wasn't created as a baby. He was created as a fully functional man. And the first thing that God did with Adam was he, he brought all the animals in front of Adam because God was interested in seeing what Adam would name them. And whatever Adam named any one of those animals as it walked by, uh, God, that, that became that animal's name. And finally, the last of them had come by, and, and well, Adam noticed immediately that, that none of them were, tr- were a truly suitable companion for him. And God agreed with Adam. God actually said it's not good that the man would be alone, should be alone. And so he had Adam lay back down and he put him to sleep, put him under general anesthesia and the first recorded surgery in history takes place as God cuts into his Adam's side and removes a rib and no, men today do not have one less rib than women, don't fall for that. But he takes his rib and closes the flesh up and, and from the rib he fashions a woman. And when Adam, when he wakes Adam up, he brings the woman to him. And Adam's first word was, and I promise you, this is in the Hebrew, oh, ho, 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 whoa. She is bone of my bones. Her bones come from my bones. Her flesh comes from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken 
from man. And Adam immediately, having seen her, recognized that a man would leave his father and mother to be joined to his wife, and the two of them would become one flesh. God had created humankind in his own image, a man and a woman in his own likeness. And God blessed them and told them that they were to reproduce and to fill the earth and, and that they were to rule over all of creation. And he added that they should eat the grains and the, and the fruits and, 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 and then well, he just turned them loose to do what he had created them to do. God saw all that he had created on the, in the evening and the morning were the sixth day and he said that it was very good. The seventh day, God was done with all of his creating. He wasn't tired, he was just finished and so he rested on the seventh day and blessed the seventh day and set it apart as holy. And that is the story from God's word. I love the idea that God created all of the animals and then brought them to Adam to give them all names. Because it becomes immediately, it immediately becomes an opportunity for Adam to bear God's image. Stop and think about it. God had shown remarkable creativity in creating all the animals, and then he lets Adam show remarkable creativity in giving names to them all. God had made them, Adam gets to name them. God did that because according to the story, he wanted to see what Adam would name them. Now clearly, listen to me. God knew what Adam was going to name them. There was no confusion on God's part. He doesn't bring them to Adam to discover what Adam is going to name them. He brings them to Adam so that he could enjoy watching Adam give names to the animals. He could enjoy watching Adam stretch his creative muscles. In the same way that I enjoy it when a little one draws a picture for me. We, I had breakfast on Friday morning with Joseph and Lorraine and their, their two little ones uh, were drawing pictures the whole time and they kept getting down from their seat and coming around and putting them next to me and giving them to me. And, and can I suggest something to you? They, they weren't fine works of art. <laughs> and they weren't fine works of art. But they were precious because of the creativity that those two little ones showed and the care that they showed in, get, in offering them to me. Some of them had words on it. Some of them were just, just as sweet and special. They're the kind of things that we put up on our refrigerator. Not because they're fine works of art, but because we enjoy the creativity that the little one showed. And the same thing is true of God in offering the, uh, giving Adam the opportunity to name the animals. But have you ever wondered... What method did Adam use to name the animals? How did he go about doing that? Did he just pull random syllable, syllables out of the air? Well, this one will be a grumpsnoop, and that one will be a grumpsnops, and that one will be a hoopslip, and this one will be a who. You know, that's Dr. Seuss. That's not Adam. He's the guy that makes up these crazy creatures and gives them insane names. That's not what Adam did. The thing is, we're not told specifically how Adam gave names to the animals, but I believe, I have a deep suspicion, that Adam gave a name to each animal that described what it was, that described what it did. And the reason that I say that is because that's what he does with Eve. When he first sees Eve, he realizes this is another of God's creations. He realizes immediately that it's his responsibility to name her, and he actually calls her woman because she has been taken from man. Man, woe, man, taken from man. He speaks immediately about the connection that exists between them. And God had said that she would be a helper to him. But listen to me, gentlemen and ladies. That means ever so much more than she's going to fry his eggs and bacon and, and perk his coffee in the morning. That's not, well, I, so, I hope it includes that in some cases. But, but let's think about this now. What, what did God mean when he said that, that, that she had, said she would be a helper for him? God had made Adam for a purpose. Do you know what that purpose was? God said it in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let's make one that will bear our image, will carry our likeness. And before God ever made Eve, he brought all the animals to Adam to see what Adam would name them. And after he names them, Adam reaches the conclusion that none of them are going to be a suitable, help, suitable companion for him. 
Well, Adam's not saying that a good dog is a bad thing. He's not saying don't have dogs and cats as companions. He's just saying that, that all these, you know, I can be friends with all of these, but they can't help me fill, live out the purpose for which I was created. They can't help me get to the place where I am what God has designed me to be. None of them are able to do that until Eve walks up to Adam there under the shade of those trees in that beautiful garden. Because immediately he realizes that this is the helper that I need. If I am ever going to live out the purpose for which God created me, I'm going to need one of these. As soon as he sees her, what does he say? She was called woman, she was taken from man, and for this cause a man will leave his father and mother. Has it occurred to you that Adam didn't have a father and mother? And will, be, and will cling to his wife, will cleave to his wife. Has it occurred to you that this is a concept that Adam knows nothing about? He's, it's I'm totally outside of Adam's experience. But he understands immediately that he's going to become one with her in every way. And that together they will live out the purpose for which God had created them. And what was that purpose? To bear God's image and to be like God. They lived out the purpose for which God had created them. And together they represented God to the rest of creation. So here it is, deep truth. Human beings were designed to bear God's image and likeness. Human beings were designed to, to bear God's image and likeness. Now I know that you're not comfortable raising your hands. I saw several of you who didn't even want to admit that you're part of a small group. I get that. And I, but just I, there's something I need to check. How many human beings do we have here this morning? If you're a human being, please raise your hand. Come on, if you're a human being, please raise your hand. Okay, it's, uh, most, most all of the hand, I would say you have like 90%. I don't know what the rest of you are. But if you've come from another planet, I would love to talk to you la later about uh, this political situation in the United States. Um, there are quite a few human beings here this morning. And so I want to ask one more question. Since you are a human being, what's your purpose in life? Look at the screen. Look, look, no, not at me. Look at the screen. Since you're a human being, what is your purpose in life? Can you just say it out loud? To bear God's image and likeness. That is your entire, per that is your reason for being here. To bear God's image and his likeness. So Adam's purpose is to bear God's image and to be like God, but it's clear that Adam couldn't do that without Eve. Because if Adam was alone, <laughs> if you think about a man bearing God's image and his likeness, if all you have is what I have to offer, you've got a pretty incomplete picture of who God is, what God, who, what God is like. It isn't until my wife and I stand together before you in the course of ministry that you get to see the gentleness and the tenderness of God as well as his strength and forcefulness. The two blend together to make a complete picture. And the same thing would be true of Eve. If Eve is alone, well, she can't bear God's image and likeness, not fully. There would be too many things left out. The picture would be incomplete. Adam and Eve were equal in creation because their purpose was the same. And all of that began the moment that God brought Eve to Adam because in the back of my heart, I can hear God saying to Adam, Adam, if you're going to live out the purpose for which I created you, you're going to need one of these. You're going to need her. How cool is that? If you're going to live out the purpose for which I created you, you're going to need her. I believe that Eve was a gift to Adam in the same way that my sweet wife who moved in with headhunters with me, in the same way that my sweet wife was a gift from God to me. I also believe that this is a habit that God has in all of our lives. And it isn't just about husbands and wives. Though I could talk about that for quite a while. It's about all the events of our lives. I believe that God gives us gifts every single day with a tag on them that says, in my case, to Jay from God. 
Every single day I get gifts from God, sometimes more than one. But every single day I get gifts from God that say, to G- you can fill in your name there. They're not, the gifts that he gives you are for you. They're not for me. But, but underneath that gift tag, there's this little addendum or appendix, which I had removed, but there's an appendix underneath it that, that says, if you're going to live out the purpose for which I created you, you're going to need one of these. And it isn't just about husbands and wives, it's about the events of our lives, the things that God gives me, the things that he gives you. And once again, I'm old enough to be able to say that some of the stuff, the gifts that he gives me, oh, I wanted that thing. I wanted it right from the beginning. I prayed for it, I asked for it, it's so beautiful. Oh, this is just what I wanted, God, thank you so much. But some of the gifts don't actually fit into that qualification. There are other times when I don't want the gifts that he gives. Sometimes they're gifts that are ugly or harsh or painful or difficult. Sometimes they're things that are, that are just dark or so it seems at the time. And at times like that, I'm inclined to get in God's face and tell him that I really don't need this thing in my life right now. I wonder how many of us have used those very words when talking to God. God, you know that I don't need this right now. <laughs> and all the while he's smiling and patting me on my bald head and saying, yes, you do, buddy. Yeah, you, you can't see what's coming, but you need today. You needed what happened today. You needed the event that I brought into your life, even though it didn't make you feel good. And sometimes I forget that those gifts, those dark, those painful, those harsh gifts, still carry those same tags to Jay from God. And by the way, Jay, if you're ever going to live out, be able to live out the purpose for which I designed you, you're going to need one of these. And I'm going to be honest this morning. God and I don't always agree. And in fact, I'll take that one step further. I would have to say that more often than not, I disagree with God as to whether or not I need that thing that happened today. A flat tire in the rain when I'm late for the meeting, God, seriously, I didn't need that. (laughs) Still has the same tag on it. Somehow God knows that I need that thing at that particular time on that particular day. It's a gift from him because his purpose is for me to bear his image and carry his likeness. I spent, it occurs to me that only one of us can be right about whether or not I need that thing. <laughs> and I'm, I, you know, I'm inclined to think that it's probably God that's right and not me, but I don't always have the courage to just come out and say that. I'll be honest with you. I'm trying to figure out, imagine how I could communicate this to you, the illustration that I could use. And uh, and the best thing that I could, I could think of was to ask you if you can tell me what that is. Anybody know what that is? Any, any guesses as to what that is? No? No? Nothing? You, you don't know what that is? I'm shocked. I mean, I, I really thought... Oh, now some of you were sitting there going... You want to share it with the rest of the class? No, probably not. I won't, I won't, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but, but uh, I, I, most of us, I, I think, are experienced enough to know that that's probably a small part of something that's much bigger. Did, did that occur to you? I mean, I, are, you, are you old enough to understand that? That's probably a small part of, 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 a, of a much bigger picture. We're too close to it. To, to really understand what it is. And I think we'd all agree that it's not really beautiful and in itself, in fact, it's, it's kind of dark and, and ugly. And for me, this is how I, it illustrates how I react to God's gifts for me. I sense the darkness. I, I see the ugliness. I feel the pain. And despite the fact that God has said, if you're going to live out the purpose for which I've created you, well, you're going to need one of these. I end up disagreeing with God. And I've learned that the reason that happens to me is because I'm only focusing on today. I'm looking at today with so closely and so close up that I can only see what happened today. And because I can only see what happened today and I forget that this is, a much, that this is part of a much larger picture, I, I don't fully want what God is offering me. 
I've forgotten that today is only a small part of a much larger picture. I've forgotten that if I would just step back and focus on the larger picture of my life, perhaps I might realize that God was right all along. I really do need this today in light of what's coming in the months or years that lie ahead. He sent it into my life and and maybe I need to learn to say I really do need one of these if ever I'm going to live out the purpose for which he created me. How do I know that? Well, look at this. That's a picture of a tapestry that was made in Peru and now hangs in the, my office there in, uh, in uh, the, our church in Missouri. It's a town in Peru, and, and I bought it because I think it's beautiful. I, I, I really do. And I would invite you to come to my office and see it in person. It's, it's really quite large, and, and, uh, but if you would come to my office, do you know what I would do? I would ask you, are you and I hope we can see this, No, that, oh, we, we, I would ask you to focus right, right, there. Put your nose right there. That's what I would ask you to do. Because you know what's right there? That's the little picture that you saw earlier. The dark and ugly picture that now finds a place in this tapestry that helps to make this tapestry beautiful. That's the part of the tapestry you saw in the last picture. It's dark and it's ugly, but it plays a part in the larger picture. You know, we're inclined when dark threads, when God weaves dark threads into our lives, we're inclined to want to, to, to pull out those particular threads. But I'd suggest that, that you and I all get in the habit of taking a full step back after one of those dark and ugly and harsh and heavy days. Just take a full step back and remember that you're seeing a small part of a much bigger tapestry. A much bigger tapestry. In the lives of the people that that you care about, you see harsh and hard and difficult things happening to them. And you wonder if they really need those threads, but they do. Because God doesn't do anything arbitrarily. He never does anything just to see how it's going to turn out. He gives you only what you need for that day as one day in a lifetime. And you know the really cool thing? When you're all done, the tapestry of you, listen to me, this is so cool. When the tapestry of you is completed, you're not going to look like a little town in Peru. (laughs) When the tapestry of you is completed, do you know what you're going to look like? You're going to bear God's image. You're going to be like God. You're going to look like and associate like and live like the Lord Jesus himself lived. That's God's goal for you. That's what the completed picture is about. And that's why these dark and heavy threads happened on Thursday or happened on Tuesday. And I would suggest to all of us, myself included, that we would get in a place in our lives where we are willing to allow God to do whatever he needs to do in pursuit of the goal that he has for you and me, that we will one day bear his image and be just like him. When the threads are dark and ugly, when the threads are bright and beautiful, when some of them are shining white and others are black and coarse, because the blackness and the coarseness provides the contrast that the picture needs to truly shine. Don't pull out those threads. It's our habit when something like that happens, when we get that diagnosis, when we have that accident, when... It's our habit to get in God's face and say, God, take this thread away from me. But perhaps it would be more wise to be thankful initially, to be thankful throughout as you see, as you recognize, as you believe, as you trust that God knows what he's doing. Because even the threads that are dark and harsh and painful have a place in the larger picture the larger tapestry that he is producing in your life. Are you interested in living out the purpose for which God created you? Are you interested in being the person that he's designed you to be? Well, then please understand that there is no such thing as a white 
tapestry. <laughs> I actually Googled it, Google images, white tapestry, and Google just sat there and laughed at me. There's no such thing as a white tapestry. Because it's just like, I don't, I don't know, it's just a picture of a white cow in a snowstorm. What are we looking at here? There's no white tapestry. The beauty, the beauty comes from the contrast. The beauty comes from the color, but it comes from the dark threads that set off the color at the same time. So we need to learn to, to, to thank God for his sweet gift today. Even though today may have involved some hardship, some difficulty, you doing something that you didn't want to do, you doing something that you were afraid to do, you doing something that, oh, I wish I didn't have to do this. Like, I don't know, get out of bed this morning. You get out of bed. That would have been easier to stay in bed, right? But here you are, here, and I'm suggesting that you getting out of bed was an important dark thread that's going to show the contrast of, of the you that leaves here to get something to eat with God's word fresh in your heart. Take the time to admit to God when things happen that if I'm ever going to live out the purpose for which he's created me, I'm going to need one of these. And, and as, you, as you talk with him, pray like this. This is how I've begun to pray. God, if I'm, if I'm going to live out the purpose for which you created me, I'm going to need every gift you've sent my way. I would never have chosen some of those gifts, and, and I would never have asked for them, but I know that without them, the beauty would be gone from my life. And so I accept those gifts, all those gifts, with a glad heart. And it's vital that we understand what God's doing in our lives as we start into Paul's letter to the Colossians because in Paul's letter to the Colossians, he, he's gonna explain who Christ is and how supreme he is. He's gonna tell us that, 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 that Jesus is our savior and that God brought things into your life before you were saved. He brought dark days into your life so that you would come to terms with who you are and how much you needed Jesus. But he's never content to just save us and then leave us because he began begins at the moment that we've come to faith in Christ, he begins at that moment to shape Christ in us so that Christ can shine through our lives and he continues to bring events into our lives that will make that possible until the day comes when Christ is supreme in our lives and God's grace is at the center of who we've become. That's what it says in verses three through eight. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. Since the day it first began, God has still been at work. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. I want to remind you that we're on a journey just like Adam and Eve were. Adam and Eve fell miserably short, but God used even that uh, in the grand scheme of things to create a, a tapestry that, that has turned out to be beautiful because of its grace. But uh, I want you to realize that they weren't able to fulfill God's purpose for their lives while they were alone. As Adam and Eve became one, God wove them together, and together they were able to bear God's image and likeness. And please understand this. That, that's why we get married. This, that's what marriage is for. We get married so that a man who is bearing God's image and likeness will join to a woman who is bearing God's image and likeness and children who grow up in that environment are going to grow up to bear God's image and likeness. And then they will marry spouses who will bear God's image and likeness. And on and on for the generation to come. The generation to come. How do we know that? Well, God speaks to husbands and wives in Malachi 2.15 where he says, Has not the one God made you? 
You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. That is God's will for your marriage. That is God's will. What is he looking for? Godly offspring. Now, if you're not able to have children, please don't, don't, don't. That's something that God is doing and, and, and that's going to be part of you bearing God's image as well as a couple. But that's what God is seeking, godly offspring who will be woven together with the godly offspring from other families as the truth of the gospel spreads. In fact, uh, the one generation to the next, surf your concordance. Get out your concordance, and not right now. No, please, just keep listening. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly done. But, but get out your concordance and look up the phrase, the generations to come. The generations to come. You're going to see that God is preoccupied, not only with you, but with the generations to come. This woven, being woven together is not limited to husband and wife and children because God quite significantly expanded the idea of being woven together when he introduced the idea of the church to the world. The people in Colossae first believed the good news when the church at Ephesus sent Epaphras to share the good news with them. God wove Epaphras into the lives of the people in Colossae who eventually became believers. And then those, the husband and wife the, the, became believers together and God is creating this pattern. But this husband and wife, they pass it on to their children and their children pass it on to, well, not just their children, but now your tapestry has been woven together with the tapestry of my family and, and, and we're all learning from one another and growing. Can you see how beautiful the picture is becoming? Can you see how God is showing Christ to the world through us as we join together because it was his plan that Christ committed followers would be woven together with other Christ committed followers and they together would make other Christ committed followers who will be woven into the tapestry as well so that they can then make other Christ committed followers and I could spend the rest of the message saying generation after generation but I hope you get the point that's what discipleship is for that's what discipleship is for. Please hear me this morning. That's why I'm here speaking to you. And that's why you're here listening to God's word. Because you as an individual are a tapestry of God's grace. You are a tapestry of God's grace. And the tapestry that is you is being woven together into the fabric of the tapestry that is me and your family is being woven into my family and I'm learning from you and I trust you're learning from me and the picture grows more and more beautiful and larger and larger every single day. So that for the generations to come, the church will be here as a glory to God in the community and as hope for the unreached world. But if you ever hope to play any kind of a role in teaching and reaching the unreached, then the work that God's grace does has to be evident in our lives. And if we ever hope to have an impact on our community, then the work that God's grace does has to be evident in our lives. And, and as evidence of that, let's, let's look at, at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Do you see the beauty coming out? Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Does that breathe life into your soul? Does that put yesterday and the mess of yesterday in perspective? Well, we've already used a, a tapestry, but I promised you two illustrations, not just one. And the time has come for us to get to the next one if we're actually going to get to lunch. We'll move on to the second where I want to use a song to illustrate one more part of what God is doing in our lives according to Paul's letter to the Colossians. And <clears throat> I'm not going to sing for you this morning because I believe that that would tax God's grace overly. And so I, I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm going to ask someone else 
to sing this song for you. And before he does, he'll give us the story behind the song. And since I'm neither qualified for reasons you'll soon see, nor equipped to tell you that story, I'm going to let a man named Wintley Phipps tell it to you. Enjoy this video. This has been an awesome night, isn't it, Wintley? Uh, I shouldn't do that to myself. I think it's absolutely amazing that the darkness and brokenness and pain of the slave trade gave birth to the best known and best loved of all hymns. As for a brief moment, a former slave, now, a former now redeemed captain of a slave ship was woven together with a slave called Unknown. I think it's equally beautiful that all that led to the day when a black, name, black man named Wintley Phipps, in the midst of all of the racial strife in the United States of America today, a black man named Wimpley, Wintley Phipps would say before singing it, that God intended to remind us that as Christians, whether black or white, bond or free, in his eyes, we're all connected. We're all connected. And we're connected by God's amazing grace. And I love that shout of hallelujah there at the end. That's the backstory of that song. And especially one of the most important parts of the song is the backstory. But there was a legacy to that song that you may, of which you may not be aware. And I want to tell you very briefly the story behind the legacy that followed that song. That story begins with a man named William Wilberforce, who was a British politician. He was born on August 24th, 1759, and his political career began in 1780 when he was just 21 years old. William Wilberforce was born in 1759, and he was born again in 1785, and his life and his lifestyle changed completely after that, after his first five years as a politician. In 1787, two years after he began to follow Jesus, he came into contact with a man named Thomas Clarkson. There'll be no quiz later, just listen to this list of names. And a group of people who were determined to see the slave trade in England put to an end once and for all. Thomas Clarkson, along with Granville Sharp, Hannah Moore, Charles Middleton, and a former slave named Equiano came over to William Wilberforce's house one night for supper and pressed him. They used illustrations. They, 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 they pressed him to take on Parliament and end the slave trade, to move Parliament to vote an end to the slave trade. He fought for the next 20 years. William Wilberforce fought for the next 20 years. He had started as one man against 300 and fought for the next 20 years until... The Trade Act of 1807 that abolished slavery and the slave trade was finally enacted by Parliament. 20 years is a long time. And as you can imagine, Wilberforce from time to time grew discouraged as he faced one defeat after another in his attempts to get the Slave Trade Act passed. And when he was defeated and at his lowest, he would go back to the town where he had grown up to talk specifically to the man who had been the pastor of his church when his, when he, where, that his family attended when he was a little boy. Wilberforce would share his discouragements and his fears with his old pastor, and inevitably the man who had been his pastor when he was a little boy would speak courage into the life of William Wilberforce and send him back out to sink those slave ships, to put an end to slavery. And with that new fervor in his heart, Wilberforce would take on the slave trade again. And the name of that pastor that William Wilberforce had known since he was a little boy, the name of that man who spurred Wilberforce to keep up the fight until every slave was free, that pastor's name was John Newton, the former slave captain, the former captain of a slave ship who had been woven together with, with this slave named Unknown, called Unknown, to write the words of Amazing Grace, to write a hymn that extols the beauty of God's grace at work in our lives. The point that I'm trying to make, 
And the point that I want you to take home with you is that Wilberforce and Clarkson and Sharp and, and Hannah Moore and, and Charles Middleton, Equiano, John Newton, this slave named unknown, called unknown, were all woven together by God in the midst of the darkness of the slave trade. And they were given the privilege together as a tapestry of God's grace of incredible beauty to take on the darkness of the slave trade, to shine the light into that darkness until that darkness dissipated. And one country after another after another followed England's lead. John Newton, by the way, was there the day the slave trade was passed, there in Parliament, up sitting up above observing. And he died not too long after that in 1807. And now here we are. More than 200 years later, and, and we're together in this room because we've been woven together for a purpose, and it's up to us to discover what that purpose is so that we can work together to accomplish that purpose for which God has brought us together. He's brought us together to make us just like Jesus, not only individually, but corporately. He's brought us together to be an expression of Christ to this world. He's brought us together, and he's woven us together and I hope that that sounds important to you this morning because it is. As we make our way through this first part of 2020, we're, we're gonna unpack Paul's letter to the Colossians where we're gonna discover that we already have what it takes to fulfill God's purpose in our lives. And it's also in the book of Colossians that we'll discover that God gives power to those who seek to live out his plan and who pursue his purpose for their lives. God is in that habit. He's been in that habit. He gave his power to, John Will to William Wilberforce and to John Newton and to that slave called unknown. And I have to tell you today that that power that we're describing there isn't just something that I want for myself. It's something that I want for every one of us here in this room today. That power is something that I want for you. And I hope that's something that you want for yourself as well. So let's go get that in 2020. Let's set our sights on that. Let's ask him for power to live out his plan and pursue his purpose in the year that lies ahead. Let's allow God's grace to do its work in our lives until the day comes when we can truly say that we are living our lives in a way that's worthy of the Lord as we please him in every way. Let's let God's grace prompt us to bear fruit in every good work so that we can grow in the knowledge of God and let's let God's grace strengthen us and empower us to patiently and thankfully endure all of our trials for his glory and for the good of those with whom we share the good news. Are you ready for 2020? I want it to be the biggest, most powerful year you have ever experienced. And so I'm going to close this message by saying what I should have said when I started it. Happy New Year. Because I think perhaps, I trust perhaps, you know what I mean when I say that. Will you stand with me in his presence? Our Father and our God, thank you today for the privilege that we have of, of being born into sin and separation from you. And then thank you for that amazing day when your grace first spoke into our lives and you saved us from our slavery. You redeemed us. God, thank you that we have the privilege now of of taking that gift that you've given us and giving it to other people, of taking the events of our lives and learning from them so that we can share with other people what your grace is able to accomplish. And God, we want to stand in your presence today and we want to look back over this last week and the last year and we recognize that you gave us things that we didn't want and we argued with you about them. But God, help us to see that you were weaving those things in to set the contrast that provides the real beauty in our lives as your grace comes to fruition in the things that we say and do. God, we pray that you'd send us out into this world, the world around us, in our community around us, in this big city, in the little places where we live, the little areas where we live, and to the ends of the earth. God, send us out with the message of redemption 
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor G.